recording. Okay, uh, so uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Sean Morton. I'm an anthropology instructor here at GPRC on Treaty 8 territory. This is my co-presenter, uh, Dr. Megan Paramaki Brown, an associate professor of archaeology at Athabasca University. And uh, as you're aware, this evening uh, we're here to share with you some uh, preliminary uh, results of our short 2021 archaeological field season at the old Byzantine town site. Uh, there, uh, the site um, consists of the remains of an early 20th century settlement, uh, roughly a 40 minute drive east of Grand Prairie along the Smoky River near its confluence with the Simonette. All right. Um, so if you had attended our uh, first presentation about Byzantine last winter, um, you would have learned uh, about our interest in the site. You would have also heard about uh, how it related to our other archaeological research in Belize and Central America. Um, and if you could not attend, uh, Megan is uh, dropping a link to the recording right now um, in the chat. Uh, you may also remember this flow chart that's on the slide right now. Uh, we used it to discuss the proposed beginnings of a community-based project at Byzantine, um, a project that is uh, with and, and by and for uh, communities of rights holders and, and stakes holders and interest groups, at least when done well. And we're hoping we're doing well. A little bit of Dave. All right. <laughs> so just, just a reminder, uh, if you are just joining us, if you could please put your videos, uh, um, turn off your video and put your uh, audio or microphone on mute. Uh, we can have you join in on video and microphone at the end with questions, but just for now, we'll mute everything. Thank you. Right, so getting back to it, the, the town site is uh, a, an early 20th century settlement, about 40 minute drive east of Grand Prairie. Uh, along the Smoky River near its confluence with the Simonette. Um, and if, uh, oh God, I've, I've gotten lost here. <laughs> <laughs> this is what happens with distractions. Okay. Nope. Community based. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> thanks, Megan. Uh, anyways, uh, like I was saying, um, if you had attended our first talk last winter, um, you will have seen this image before. Um, and we would have talked about uh, our interest in Byzantium. We would have also talked about our other research in Belize. Um, and again, Megan has dropped the link to that talk uh, so that you can, you can watch it. Um, you may also remember, again, this flowchart, which we showed you last time, which we used to discuss the proposed beginnings of a community-based project of Byzantium. Um, and as I said, that is a project that is uh, with and by and for communities of rights holders and stakeholders and interest groups. Um, and during that first meeting and in the weeks following, uh, we also sought to understand community interest in research at the town site as part of our one uh, reconnaissance and consultation. Now, when we say community, uh, we mean here that of the local Byzantin area and of the county of GP today, uh, the multiple historical and heritage communities and societies of the Peace region, uh, local indigenous communities and organizations and the local archeological community in general. Um, and from that experience, we felt we received very positive feedback and proceeded into the following steps and stages. Um, tonight, uh, again, once we provided a bit of a background to the site and our interests, uh, we're going to kind of take you back through the preliminary archaeological reconnaissance of this flowchart um, to tell you what has happened so far. We'll then talk about what we hope to happen. Um, in the next couple of years as part of stages two and three and how you can become involved. Um, and when we're done, uh, it should take about, I don't know, 20 or 30 minutes, um, then we'll open it up for, for questions. Um, we'll also open it up for comments, right? We um, hope you'll wanna bring other related topics to our attention or perhaps answer some questions regarding some of the mysteries we came across this last season, because there are a few mysteries and it'd be great to get your help on those. So, as we mentioned during our previous presentation, uh, we're both archaeologists. Uh, so we're scholars who examine both recent and distant pasts by material culture um, or the belongings people leave behind. And in particular, we're interested in the topic of frontiers um, as it relates to notions of archaeological cultures, so uh, material culture regions, 
uh, and notions within societies today and of the past. And, and considering uh, this interest, we're fascinated by the development of rapid growth communities or boom towns um, that typically occur in frontier regions. Um, not only are we interested in what led to their booms, but also their busts and then everything in between. Uh, we've been exploring these topics in Belize with our work there at an ancient town site where a Maya community lived over a thousand years ago. Um, and we're also dropping a link to that project website uh, in the chat uh, where you can see our previous publications and other information. Thanks, Megan. Uh, understanding the life ways represented in small towns and villages is essential to, under, or to settlement archaeologists such as ourselves, as such locales are the seedbeds for urban development. We often think of such frontier settlements as developing in response to demands from further abroad, so um, what we might call heartlands. However, they're also the center of their own regions and deserve to be understood as places of unique relationships, innovations, and experiences. The old Byzantine town site uh, caught our attention when we first moved to Grand Prairie back in 2019. And we find it particularly interesting um, because of Anne Byzantine's boosterism at the start of its development. Uh, a brief account of the beginnings of the town and then it's rather a sudden failure in the face of incorrect route speculation for the Canadian Northern Railroad, um, for the most part, uh, represent the limit of the settlement's published historical record. Um, some documented oral history exists regarding life at the town site, uh, along with photographs covering its short history from about 1910 to 1926. Um, still, as you'll see, there are problems with these accounts in terms of relating them to what we currently understand of the archaeological record. Um, there are also additional newspaper items, census data, and title documents that we need to collect and go through more thoroughly. Although the settler town of Byzantin was short-lived, uh, this region has a deep history of Indigenous presence going back thousands of years and continuing today. And this deep history is not captured uh, within the historical documentary record of the town site and requires the combination of Indigenous oral histories uh, and archaeological science to better understand it. The more recent uh, community uh, sorry, uh, the more recent entanglements between uh, Indigenous peoples and early 20th cent century settler communities is similarly not well known beyond oral histories. Uh, most historical and archaeological research has uh, focused on those relationships as they existed within the earlier fur trade period. So there's an opportunity there at the Zanson. So what did we accomplish during the summer of 2021? Well, field work took place in late July and early August. Um, we had 11 field days total. Usually when we first start a field program, we do only a couple of weeks just to kind of get our feet wet uh, and to help us with further planning. Uh, and so first off, uh, we want to thank the numerous uh, people and organizations who supported us in this research stage. Um, so this involved uh, securing permits and permissions, uh, conducting actual survey, mapping and testing at the site and helping to mobilize the knowledge we've since generated. So including promoting attendance to this talk. Um, we're probably missing uh, many others, but hopefully this list on this slide here kind of captures the scope of community collaborators and supporters already involved at this early stage. Now, our first task at the site following a wonderful tour from uh, Wanda Zenner and a safety orientation from the county was to initiate a GPS survey and begin mapping archeological features such as pits, which may represent say building cellars and berms, which may be building foundations. Um, and if you've ever visited the site, which is open to the public as a municipal park, uh, you'll have noted that none of the historic building superstructures remain. Um, they were all dismantled or moved at abandonment or uh, were destroyed by fire or, or some other disaster. Um, now, uh, Byzantine was first documented as a heritage uh, site for the province in 1986. Uh, this was not done under an archaeological permit, so survey data were omitted including feature maps and their locations within the area. And as you can imagine, uh, this is a big job that requires the clearing of brush to pull measuring tapes and take compass readings. Um, and we started by visiting the known features in the park, most of which 
are marked by a square or house shaped signs like you can see on the slide here. Um, and based on oral accounts of where particular buildings were located. Um, we would take a set of GPS coordinates with a handheld unit at the signpost for each location and another set of coordinates with a fancier differential GPS unit, uh, courtesy of local survey expert, Patrick Cochran. Thanks, Patrick. Nice to see you here, by the way. Um, at specific points on the related feature, um, we then clear the brush and map the feature. So if we take the location of the Zanson's house as an example of our typical approach, uh, which you walk over on one of the many trails at the site. Uh, you can see historic photos of the uh, location on the site sign. It's, uh, it's well done. Um, anyways, we started by clearing the associated foundation berm, as well as parts of the veranda foundation and nearby root cellar. Um, and these were all mapped using a, just a measuring tape and compass, so really basic at this point. Uh, this GPS survey and mapping work is allowing us to build a more accurate map of town features as they're presented at the site, reflecting both oral histories and actual archaeological features on the ground. Uh, we then use this data to compare our results to existing town site maps of the documentary histories. And these include a sketch map uh, produced for the information panels at the park, uh, so on the left there, and the town site plan created for Byzantine's boostering pamphlet. Uh, and to sell lots. Uh, and as you can tell from this image here, uh, things are not perfectly aligned. And this suggests some inconsistencies between all three sources of information uh, that are important topics for further research and something that archeology span can actually kind of dig into and help figure out. After attempting to locate archeological features in the immediate vicinity of signed building locations, um, and some we could find and some we couldn't, um, we conducted pedestrian surveys, so spreading out um, from these locations to identify additional or, or misplaced features within about a 20 to 30 meter radius. Some of these identifications included Byzantine Cellar and Crokin Cellar, uh, which were off the trails and further away from signposts and had since grown over. Uh, as you can imagine, doing this in late July is quite uh, tricky due to the kind of thick vegetation covering most of the park, although it was amazing if you were into Saskatoon berries and raspberries. Um, but for that reason, uh, we also turned to imagery uh, produced from low resolution LIDAR held by the provincial government and county. Um, and we could mark potential features that we could then ground truth, so locate and, and visit them. Uh, and we need to ground truth uh, most features because some that look like archaeological features on the LIDAR imagery are actually piles of brush uh, from the clearing of campsites um, and, and roads uh, in the current park. At our last presentation and in conversation with various community members following, um, we were asked to try and locate the site of the original church, which was built by Reverend Forbes, um, said to be on two lots uphill at the town, which isn't really much to go on. <laughs> um, and it was with the LIDAR that we had hoped to, to locate it. Now, looking at the LIDAR, we did come across one major feature um, that was not identified on any existing maps or signage at the site. And you can see it kind of highlighted by the orange box in the left picture here. Um, and this consisted of a rectilinear low cobble berm. Um, so measuring 30 meters east-west by about 50 meters north-south. Uh, and the berm itself ranges between 60 to 80 meter, or centimeters in width um, and 30 to 50 centimeters in height. And the entire interior of this kind of demarcated area is packed by a, a pebble cobble surface. This delineated area is of comparable dimensions uh, to the Glen Leslie Church and surrounding yard. However, um, we also found two pit features in the middle that may rule out the church, uh, along with other clues. Um, so these are roughly rectangular in shape, uh, so 10 by 6 meters and 10 by 3 meters, uh, and about 50 centimeters deep. The entire feature is oriented north-south, uh, like many other archaeological features at the site, uh, but is also aligned with the park road that comes down into the town site. And, and so it, it might be a later construction. Um, we're not sure if any of you know, um, that would be very helpful. Uh, Wanda Zenner offered us a compelling idea of what this feature might be. So she showed us an ad in the Grand Prairie Herald from 1916 that announced the building of the very first Ford dealership in the Peace region, which was supposed to be at Byzantine. 
Um, and while the description of store and associated shop dimensions fits with this feature, um, the stated location of lots doesn't. Um, so the Ford dealership was supposed to be on the corner of Main Street and Third Avenue South. This is where we run into uh, issues in terms of documentary and oral history sources. So it, it's not clear if the town plan now on file with the government represents an actual surveyed reality um, or if it's just a version of the preliminary plan. Um, there are inconsistencies with uh, street and avenue names on the government map kept for title searches, um, Byzantine's pamphlet map, the sketch uh, my map based on oral histories and various documents that discuss locales at the town. So for example, as mentioned, the Ford dealership was to be located on the corner of Main Street and Third Avenue South, but Third Avenue South doesn't actually appear on any of the maps. Um, there are additional inconsistencies regarding the naming of streets on, on all three that we're trying to trying to work through. All right, so what happens after we map those features? Um, well, this is when we start to use our shovels. Uh, it's an important first step to identify features, uh, but we also want to know the condition of those features and the area immediately surrounding them. Before engaging in full archaeological investigation, so what we might call the dig, uh, we need to understand the geological strata and the taphonomic factors at play, and that is what elements both natural and cultural impact contexts and materials when they are deposited and become buried over time at Byzantium. In. Basically, we need to anticipate what problems we'll run into when it comes to actually excavating. For example, in this region, archaeological deposits are incredibly shallow, at least compared to what we usually deal with in Belize. So within like the top 20 centimeters, we can run into materials from yesterday all the way back to thousands of years ago. These sit atop glacial deposits called till. In the Byzantine area, we, con we consistently hit this layer at around 20 to 25 centimeters, sometimes shallower and sometimes deeper. So separating out layers within these superficial deposits is critical. An example would be at the Hall and Leonard store where we did, we did a small test pitting program. Basically a series of 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter square holes are dug with a shovel across a grid. We encountered bottle glass and a lithic flake in one of our shovel pits. In one of our shovel pits, a flake removed uh, from a stone for the purpose of making a stone tool. Now, because these are not formal excavations dug in levels, we cannot easily determine where that lithic flake came from in the vertical pit, higher up or lower down, which could give us a clue as to whether it is older or younger. Uh, it is an artifact type, so the lithics are an artifact type that could easily date to any period back thousands of years. So from this test pit, we know we have the chance of encountering, in, of encountering indigenous lithic materials that could be much older than the Byzantine settlement or roughly contemporaneous if people were still flaking, to, flaking stones. We need to be able to separate out those older layers from the more recent ones. Test pitting also allows us to quickly locate areas with a high probability of materials. For example, at Byzantine's house, the area beneath the veranda and between the main house and the cellar, where the ice house was reportedly located, contained the largest concentration of material that we recovered at the town site. We also learned that the local landscape will likely pose a problem for us, specifically the steep cliffs that line the site's south side. Why is that? People love throwing their garbage down hills. So how do we locate those piles for further testing? Can we even locate them? Our testing program at select locations at the town site, some of those likely to be high potential and some of those where we could not find archeological features but did have a sign, um, were of mixed success. Uh, where we thought we would find material, we did. So at Byzantine's house, Hall and Leonard's store, the shoe, and, the shoe slash harness shop area and the restaurant area. 
Our shovel pits also found nothing in, in the few places we tested where we had signs for buildings, but no surface archaeological features. This perhaps suggests that the oral histories that led to identifying locales with signs are incorrect. We could not test all such areas this summer. Um, we were only there for 11 days, uh, but we plan to continue to do so in coming seasons. Um, of materials we did recover, there were no huge surprises. All items were typically of early 20th or were typical of early 20th century sites, including bottle glass, window glass, nails of various types, various pieces of metal, pottery, etc. This, the, this tells us there are intact garbage or refuse deposits, which is good. That's what we want. Unlike what is suggested on the original heritage form from the 1980s, we did not identify any clear middens of materials visible on surface. However, this may be a matter of change in vegetation coverage since the 1980s, or an assumption on the part of the, the, the person who did the recording that unknown mounded features were middens. We did find strange midden-like features or mounds uh, near Holland Leonard's store in Byzantine's house during the survey. However, most turned out to be fallen trees and stumps covered in accumulated soil and moss. So it's not easy to correlate mounds with middens unless there's garbage sticking out of the ground, really, or you test it uh, with test pits. Additionally, as it has been over 90 years since the town was abandoned, associated abandonment processes, later scavenging by people and even metal detecting by enthusiasts have likely uh, have likely impacted to some degree what remains in terms of artifacts. Some neat preliminary observations from the materials include what people were eating. We think <laughs> we think we found a sardine can from Byzantine, Byzantine's house hidden under the veranda. Uh, additionally, we found that all nails were wire or machine cut, which makes sense for the early 20th century. We also found sun-colored amethyst bottle glass. This purple color is caused by manganese dioxide used as a clearing agent in glass prior to World War I, which again helps to secure the chronologies of the context that we're examining. So from our short 2021 field season, we've determined that the old Byzantine town site has very good potential for archaeological investigation into the lifeways of a burgeoning boom town. We also, despite the, some, of the, some of the challenges we mentioned, we also feel this is an ideal case study to examine how oral histories, documentary histories, and the archaeological record do or do not intersect. The location also has excellent potential to promote the history of the region and engage the public in diverse storytelling related to both recent and deeper histories. In the following weeks, we'll be finishing up pulling together our final report about the 2021 season for the government of Alberta, as well as applying for funding from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada and other sources and putting in for our 2022 permit. We want to secure monies to continue our survey and testing at Byzantine, as well as to initiate actual excavations at select locations, including at Byzantine's house, arguably the oldest and most representative of locales at the site, as well as Hall and Leonard's store and Morrison's store, which will likely be key to assessing the material culture of lifeways over time um, during the settler settlement period. We are also uh, aiming to secure funding for higher resolution LIDAR, um, so this is quite low resolution that we had access to. Higher resolution LIDAR to be flown by a local company this fall, which will, will, will allow us to better identify features beyond those signed at the site, even those only 30 centimeters deep or tall, um, which we can then ground truth in summer of 2023. We also want to engage more test pitting to locate deposits for excavation. We'll likely even use a metal detector, especially at the possible, at the unknown, the, the mystery feature, uh, where we found nothing, to, nothing in our limited test pitting there. Um, in terms of documentary history of the site, we're also trying to secure funds for historic land title searches uh, for individual town lots to try to match them up with the archaeological and oral histories, uh, if possible. So how can you get involved? So if you've heard this presentation and are now really interested in getting involved, there are a number of ways you can contribute. 
Uh, you can volunteer to come out with us next summer uh, to do additional survey and testing and, and maybe even excavate if we if we get to that point. We provide sandwiches. We provide sandwiches, yes. Uh, if we do secure larger funding, uh, we hope to even hire, like officially hire some students to work with us for a month uh, and eventually develop a field school and public dig program. We also need people to record and or account uh, oral histories about the town site. Continuing with newspaper searches and other archive research that Wanda has initiated will also be critical. We're also hoping to have people involved in ethnobotanical surveys at the site. Uh, for example, noting plants such as uh, beaked hazelnut, uh, which we did uh, notice at the site, uh, which were important foods to indigenous peoples and often found at their settlement sites. Uh, and we're, um, uh, as of yesterday, we have Dr. Janelle Baker at Athabasca University. She's a Métis ethnobotanist who's going to be joining us. Um, so this information would add to the existing research by Dr. Joan, Joan Snyder, uh, as presented in the booklet, Native Flowers, Shrubs, and Trees of the Byzantine Town Site. Uh, here, here it is. Uh, which you can actually purchase at Trapper Gourds on Highway 40, 43 if you're heading that way. Um, we also need uh, help locating additional funds for the research, um, perhaps even funds targeted at specific elements of the research. So for example, we could uh, maybe uh, be finding out contacts for the Ford dealership in town to sponsor our search for the earliest dealership in the region at Byzantin. Uh, you can also help by spreading the word about the research, um, contributing uh, in terms of the questions you are interested in, where you want the research uh, to go, um, but also visiting the site yourself and promoting the town site to visitors. Finally, you can help all heritage professionals by discouraging and reporting metal detecting at heritage sites, both recent and ancient and other illegal activities. So before we turn the floor over to you for your questions and comments or feedback um, input, uh, we have a few questions we're hoping to have some of you answer maybe. Uh, first is the location of the church and school, if, it, does any, if anyone has any hints as to where uh, we should be looking, uh, or the Ford dealership for that matter. Uh, any idea about what our mystery feature might be? We're increasingly thinking that it might be something in between the that appeared in between the time period of the town site and then when it became a park or maybe even an early if uh, we don't we don't know what happened basically we have no clue what's going on from 1926 <laughs> until the opening of the park so we'd like more information on that but there's some reasons why we think it, it might be associated with that um what about other buildings and spaces that aren't signed at the site that you might know of um we're especially interested in the location of houses um, we also need to know more about the town site after abandonment so what was it used for up until the time it became a park Finally, the town site survey in Byzantine's book, Sodbusters Invade the Peace, it says Sidney Webb was told to hire William McFarland to survey the town site. We assume it is the plan currently on file for land title searches, which is very similar to the idealized plan in Byzantine's boostering pamphlet. Neither seems to consider land formation or topography. Uh, there's also confusion in the literature as to whether it was ever officially registered. For example, it doesn't appear in Anne Holtz's inventory and study of small town Alberta plans, and we we're kind of wondering why. Um, so we're looking for some clarification on that matter. So those are some questions we'll we'll leave you with, um, and we can someone can bring them up now if they'd like to, uh, or or you can talk to us at another time. But basically, we just uh, like to say uh, thank you very much uh, for attending. We look forward to the next uh, 30 minutes. Uh, <laughs> we scripted this talk compared to the last talk where we just kept going on and on. Uh, so apologies for us sort of reading from this, but we didn't want to take up too much of your time. Um, and this this 30 minutes is dedicated entirely to, to you all. Um, if you have any questions, comments, uh, feedback, um, Anything. anything really yeah. uh, ideally anything that's related to the topic <laughs> but that's about it <laughs> yeah so um, from my perspective uh, uh in the presbyterian history society of canada 
I can do some digging uh, on reports from Forbes and his wife from their missionary work in the peace country with their museum uh, back in Ontario and see if they have any site plans or reports that give any information on the church site. Um, that's one place I can do some digging from the, the missionary board end of things. That would be brilliant. Thanks, Doug. Okay, I'll get on that. <laughs> <laughs> added to your list of eight million other things you're doing right now well yeah. <laughs> phones are our friends funny thing with that like just with um if you've read his his biography or not really his biography that that sod buster is how he talks about how he 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 agreed to give these two lots to forbes and in, in return, Forbes was supposed to give him two, two lots, lots near his place in Grand Prairie. <laughs> and this call, the comment in the book is like, and I'm still waiting for those <laughs> lots, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> snippy, snappy. Snappy. Yeah. Stephen says she's excited to hear Janelle Baker is going to be uh, doing the Ethnobotanical. Yes, yeah, so. Yeah, Janelle uh, Baker, if you don't know her, she uh, is a colleague of mine at Athabasca University. She does a lot of work with communities, uh, Indigenous communities throughout um, Northern Alberta, actually. Um, she's usually looking at things like uh, berry patch contamination and things like that uh, related to modern modern industrial activity and things like that. Uh, but she's, um, we've asked her to come on as sort of a, um, an advisor, particularly for an MA student, because we would like to have a graduate student do an official ethnobotanical survey. And so she would be in that position. So Stephanie, if you uh, hurry up and finish your um, undergraduate, you could sign up and uh, become one of Janelle's master students and work with us. <laughs> Is that the gauntlet thrown down right yeah. there? <laughs> so Ooh. I guess, oh, Hi, Patrick. Hi, Patrick. Hi, yes, Pat Wormo. Um, By the way, you can turn your cameras on. If anybody wants to be actually on camera, now you can turn it on. Um, yeah, we're not, anyway. we're not flipping around anymore, so it won't, yeah. it won't lag things or anything. Yeah. It'd be great to see your faces. Mm. Oh, there we go. Well, there I am. Yeah, I had a couple of questions. The first one was, uh, you mentioned that the town survey being done by a William uh, McFarland. McFarland. The yeah. famous one in this country was named Walter. Is there a. Oh, it might actually be Walter. I might have just gotten that wrong. So okay. it's whoever did the um, the Dominion survey for the Grand Prairie area. It's the yeah, same. That was, that was Walter. Okay. And uh, I think somewhere I've probably got his actual, I know I've got his signature and perhaps his survey or DLS number. If you want to check it on the because he would have had to sign that somewhere, I think. Yeah, yeah, that would be handy. Yeah, my other question was, uh, because I am part of the uh, Peace Country Historical Society, when are you on site? Because I was thinking it might make a good tour for us if huh. um, it's possible this summer. I think we're looking for essentially the same time as last year. So it'd be kind of July, August. So if, if all goes according to plan and um, uh, then we will be back in Belize for May, June. So okay. continuing our work there. And then, so we're essentially that timing is set to beat the rainy season in Belize, right? right. Uh, so it's fairly set for us if we can go and then we'll be back here. And July and August is a beautiful time to be out at the town site anyways. Um, particularly again with the Saskatoons and the raspberries. Um. <laughs> but it's also it's also quite we, we've noticed and we don't know if this is always but we were down there a couple I think two two years ago mm -hmm. um, in the May June period and it was very wet and so that that's sort of somewhat problematic for us um, so in that way July August works better because it hasn't been as wet at least during the years we've been here acknowledging we've not been here for a long period of time although so. this summer was a particularly wet summer right i don't know was it was here i people kept saying it was very rainy and so yeah. if it was dry this summer then it must be great <laughs> yeah no july well june uh, spring is um yeah typically a little wetter than the next two that's for sure okay uh i just 
thanks then for those dates that uh, help us make a plan. And of course, the first plan is when might we come? So we'll, uh, well, we can we'll get at that. When we get like set hard dates, um, we'll, we'll get a hold of you and let you know. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Great presentation. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks for um, the articles that both you and Wanda wrote about the summer um, in the society newsletters and on the Byzantine website. Um, it was really appreciated to get the word out. Yes. Well, you're more than welcome. And uh, another one coming, I hope, always looking for content. <laughs> I see Dana, Dana mentioned that it's uh, usually wet um, through May and into June, early June. So yeah, that, that reinforces our, our plan to go in July, August. Thanks, Dana. It was drier down there. So, ah. so I, I mean, as people think of some other questions, what about the questions we had for you? <laughs> Does anybody have any thoughts on on any of those on our weird feature information what what happened uh, in that area following the last person leaving in I think 1926 is what we, we heard before that uh, Mike oh sorry uh, Daryl Breziak were you about to say something yeah I, I just wanted to say that um... Dave Leonard has done a lot of research on the homesteading history in that area, and he might have a good idea of what happened uh, in that area after 1926. And, and just, I also want to say that the Archaeological Survey of Alberta is very happy to see a public archaeology program in the Peace Re Region again. Uh, there used to be many of them back in the day uh, when Milt Wright was kind of uh, heading the Peace Region of the ASA guys like Mort Timmonson and many others were very avid avocational archaeologists. So this is all really great stuff. Excellent. Hopefully, hopefully it goes off to a hitch. Well, we, I know we're finding the site really interesting and we're pretty, we're pretty jazzed with the amount of um, support that we're, we're getting from, from folks and, and interest from the community. It's, 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 we're feeling pretty lucky right now. And I think what, one of the nice things too is, um, the legacy element for the pre like previous archaeology projects, um, we 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 started clearing out an area at the college for a lab space, and uh, there was actually a bunch of the uh, old archaeological equipment from those previous projects that was left there, and so we've sort of inherited. So we'll carry forward sort of some of that regional legacy into this. Yeah, they had some really nicely labeled dig kits and stuff. Yeah, they had really nice dust pans. <laughs> we were excited about that when we opened it. Yeah. yeah, that's all great stuff. And are you hooked up with uh, Greg Quitchen from Taiga? Because he's doing a lot of public stuff as well. Actually, he's our he's our public guru on this. So um, he might be, he said he was going to be here tonight, but I don't see his name on the list here. So I guess he, he wasn't able to make it. Um, he's another one of the collaborators, um, uh, along with Wanda and Duff um, and uh, uh, Charles um, Taves on the, on, on the grant that we're writing right now. But uh, yeah, specifically, Greg's there because of, I mean, because of his expertise in the area in general, um, but, but also because of all the public work he's been doing um, and the school outreach and all this kind of stuff. So we had, we were lucky enough, he was, um, he invited an invitation to hang out and take part in some of his stuff this summer. And, and we did. Oh, great. I, I mean, he runs a fantastic kind of show. And so, yeah, we're, we're hoping that he'll, help us get this going in the same kind of way. Yeah, definitely a good collaboration. And one last question is, uh, have you looked into Alberta Historical Resource Foundation grants for your work? Ah, so uh, Greg actually <laughs> just this week mentioned um, that we should, we should look at that. Um, and you might be the perfect person to ask about this. So the, we, we looked at it, they're due yeah, they do. They, they might be due right at the end of January here. Like they're coming up pretty soon. Yeah, very, very, very soon. So if you email me, I'll give you um, our coordinators 
uh, contact information. Okay, then we will definitely do that when we write a note here. Great. Yeah. Well, Good thanks. stuff. All right. Um, and then it looks like my oh. I responded to my. Uh, yeah, yeah, Mike. So again, we did so few test kits. Um, most of the time was spent just on locating and mapping features. And then we just targeted a few areas um, and we'll do more uh, in coming seasons. Uh, but we only found the one, the one flake uh, in the one bit. Um, but it was a flake. And so that was exciting. Um, and I imagine more stuff will come up in the future. And there is, there's accounts, right, um, uh, of, I think Wanda might be able to talk about this a bit more, but uh, is it accounts by uh, uh, Dorothy saying, um, noticing um, Indigenous encampments along the river close by? And so the, the likely presence of recent, uh, very more recent Indigenous um, people right in that uh, area uh, we have, and most likely, I think we would find stuff further back as well. Well, I mean, if, if memory serves too, wasn't, didn't Maynard Byzantin, I mean, he, one of the things that attracted him to that area was that it had been a traditional crossing point yeah, of the river the anyways, point. right? So, so I could be wrong on that, but I, I seem to remember that being the case. Um, do you have any more details on that, Wanda? To put you on the spot. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, this is his homestead that was on the flat, mm -hmm. and that's where the Slave Lake Trail crossed right there. Yeah, because you could ford the river easily. Not at the town site, but down on his homestead flat. Okay. 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 But pretty. I mean, it, the fact that there is a lot of activity uh, close by, so. And that, I mean, the area I think would be quite. I mean, the, the quite ideal. If anybody's been out to the site, it's, it's it has all those things that you would look for if you were looking for a a good, um, you know, uh, pre-European campsite. Like it's got the the view up and down the river is amazing. Um, to other at, at to confluence points, like it's. It's a it's a rather nice spot. And I think Greg Greg had said that um, there had been some landowners in the area that had approached him saying they had uh, they'd found some stuff on their properties and to eventually come out and take a look. <laughs> um, I imagine there is uh, I, I don't think that there were no there was maybe one other site in the, the just, there was one other site that that popped up um, in the the database. Uh, within that section, um, but it, it wasn't anything huge. But. D Donna, yeah. You have a question? Donna? See your hand up. <laughs> I think she was having some problems earlier. So maybe. Yes, she just asked me, how do you talk? So I... <laughs> <laughs> well, she's wanting to say something for sure here. Yeah, Donna, if it doesn't work, just chat, put it in the chat if you can, um, if that's possible. <laughs> oh. well, while we're, we're waiting, I would just love to thank both of you. Uh, it was a wonderful experience and uh, I think if I I think I found two people I like to talk about the Bizantz and Talos I just about as much as I do so thank you for that <laughs> thank you for wanting to talk about it <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually so uh, Chantel you mentioned in the in the chat there that um, you're, you're I just want to can you hear me yeah, yeah. No, 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 there we go Um, can you hear me? No? Yes. Yep. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. We can hear you. <laughs> huh. 
All right. Well, well, Donna <laughs> is figuring that out. Um, uh, Chantelle had mentioned um, something about her grade four class. So I know that you can hear me. Okay, yeah, I, I was just about to put it. the chat here so I wanted to ask I had invited several schools to participate in June in June so so hmm. because I thought maybe they could bring students or something during um June but that doesn't sound possible so I'm just wondering do you have any so you could hear me yes right I, I just had invited them Peace Wapiti to participate in this um, event, right? Thinking that possibly there was. Okay, so so we see we saw your question in the in the chat. So about about schools joining, yeah. So that um, well, one thing again for the June part right now, um, it, it's very much dependent on what happens with our other research. So that's a big issue that we probably wouldn't be out there for Ju until July, August. Um, also, we have to sort of definitely having people come and be around. Uh, again, kid, children wise, uh, we have to have sort of specific conversations about what to do with kids. Um, we have, uh, there are many archeological programs that we can do with, with kids. Um, not necessarily everything because we also have a responsibility not only to the community but also to the archaeological record right and so we have we would have to carefully sort of plan what we would do with different um class uh class groups uh, so for example I, I think greg and taiga you know they have certain age limits um uh, other programs we've worked with also have different age limits uh, but we also have to get to a point where we would do something like that uh formally um, and whether that would be something to happen next year, not sure, but something more formally after that, for sure. And there's a matter of permitting involved with that as well. And so we'd have to sit and formally uh, think that out. Um, but that's definitely the direction we want to be heading in. Um, but, but there has to be sort of formal planning because there's also safety matters too, right? Like we have to have, um, we have to sit through that, not only, uh, not only with ourselves, uh, but also with teachers, uh, what support will be there alongside students, things like that. So, but it's definitely the direction we want to be heading. Yeah, right. and that, actually, that makes a lot of sense. And actually, uh, so both for Chantel and Donna, like this is the, this is the kind of conversation that we can and should and would love to be to be having, right? Because if we can create a an educational program, even if it doesn't start, say immediately this year, right? Um, but say is, is, is next year or something like this or, or, or whenever we can get it rolling. But if we can work together to make something that works for you as a, as a, as a teacher and with your class and kind of make something that isn't just, um, so it doesn't just work for us. So it works for, <laughs> for, for you. I think like this is an opportunity to, to actually work, work that in right at the start. So if, you, if we would very much like it, if you wanted to keep chatting about um, kind of what you would like to see and, and how you would like to see it work. Um, we can tell you what we've kind of gotten up to or seen at other sites that have um, been structured this way. Um, mm -hmm. And we can make something that like really fits with say your curriculum or your class or, or whatever. Right, that would be amazing. We, um, that's the sense I was getting that you're in, just in the beginning stages of your research. So we have been down to the Zanson Town site before, um, but it would be amazing if there were you know, more signs or more maps and um, things that we could connect to our curriculum and have just a bit more knowledge going down there because we've been down there before. And it's kind of like, oh, run around and oh, there's this here and there's this here, but just fitting it all together to help it make sense in different age groups. I think especially too, because if normally we do, we will work July, August, that doesn't really work for classes, but if we can pull something together for mm -hmm. classes to go during the school year, like for example, some kind of an activity pack, information pack, like from Byzantine, from sort of the view of archeologists or something. So you can learn about different features and 
you could you can practice because you can see the features right there right so a lot of them are right near the parking the parking area and so you know you could go with kids and you can practice measuring um with measuring tapes you can learn how to use an orienteering compass and you can learn how to map like we can we can develop those types of packages and put them in the hands of teachers instead of um you relying on uh, necessarily for us to be there although that would be great for us to be there too, but we could create those sorts of things to be used during the school period as well. Yeah. And this sounds like, again, a conversation that would be great with, with you, Chantel, and Donna, and Amanda. And I know our principal is on this call as well. <laughs> <laughs> so she's probably listening closely. Uh, and, then, and then obviously, so Duff has been creating um, educational packets as well. Wanda has been wanting to kind of upgrade the signage and stuff at the, at the site. So, um, right. So I think I think this is something that we can definitely get behind and kind of help with and I'll, I'll pile in on. Yeah, it's awesome that we're so close. I know in my curriculum right now in social studies, we're talking um, it's mostly the history of Alberta and right now it's fossil fuels and fossils and paleontology. So my grade fours are going to think that you're the Joseph Tyrells of archaeology. Right. <laughs> That's very exciting. Something that uh, the History Society is working with with Sue Thompson and with Charles Taws and the museum is the creation of ed, um, educational packages. Right now we're focusing on indigenous history because so little is known here and teachers need access to whatever we can find. So we have one package put together um, on Treaty 8 and we'll be looking at others on the Indian Act and things like that. So that um, even if we can't be there in person, teachers can log in, lock in and, and pick up this information um, for their own uh, information and for classes too. So we're just getting going on that. But uh, the Treaty 8 um, one is basically underway, and um, the Indian Act will be coming up soon. That would be awesome. We love resources, especially when it relates so close to home and having our school right there. Well, and, and I think, too, in developing um, materials that don't separate out Indigenous and settler, right? Mm. And this is the perfect... In our mind too, um, is yes, we're focusing on Byzantine, in the, the early 1900s settler settlement, but the deep history of that location on the landscape is all tied in, right? And so it's not, we can't, we shouldn't be separating them out. They should all be together um, and to understand sort of that entanglement of the past and the, the more recent history but also not create those divides because it we know it's not just settler people there um some so of that's, some, of that's the, some of that's the discipline i mean uh, yeah. archaeology and archives do not usually meet um and so for us to work from the archive perspective we're always in published documents or uh, written documents and that's where archaeology has so much to provide but um in the end, what we're going to need is a general report that does a longitudinal connection uh, on that site. Um, and that's something where future collaboration, we can do something like that um, for sure. Um, it's just the problem is that archives, uh, where we started, uh, doesn't go below the ground. Yeah. We're uh, geographically and um, paleologically uh, retarded that way. <laughs> Well, and, and again, like we've, we've already started to, to notice, the archives and the oral histories and the archaeology don't always line up. line up. And so what does that mean? Uh, how do you bring all of those bits of information together and, and respect them all um, and use them together to create a sort of a, a more holistic, fuller understanding of, of life in that, that location uh, through an extended period of, of time. Yes, that means that the archeologists are gonna keep the historians honest. <laughs> and vice versa, <laughs> right? Versa. I mean, yeah. Wait a minute, well, it wasn't there, it was over here. Yeah. Well, actually, so there, it's funny, there, there's some pretty major, um, just thinking of those maps, for instance, right? And yeah. forget the, the idea that like there's street, street inconsistencies and stuff like this but there's just some interesting differences in terms of so things like the location of the train station so the on the sketch the, the sketch map that's used at the site for kind of uh, running you know navigating around the site 
Um, it has the train station down to the southwest, right? As this, this little block there. Um, but then if you look on the proposal, it, it, looks, it looks like it's on the southeast corner of the town plan. And if you look at the version in the pamphlet, the block of land in the southeast is left mostly blank, which is makes sense considering that it's on it's off the bluff. Like it's but I think I think off, too, there's nothing, there's no there's no flat land there. I think too there were also rules, right? Like about land closest to the rail line, how much the railway company immediately received. Mm -hmm. And so I think there was that, but then some of those rules changed and but the in the title version of the map they they actually have it's subdivided more there's there's lots more lots in there which is weird because again at least based on the overlay that uh, patrick uh cochran had pulled together um those lots are like they are there's no flat land it is over the bluff like there's so whoever was selling those lots <laughs> was selling a selling a jewel to people. I mean, it's speculation. Yeah. It this reminds me of the famous Dunvegan uh, lots, which are on a 45 degree angle. Yeah, yeah, we, we came across that as well. Yeah. yeah. Actually, a, a friend of mine, uh, sort of completely unrelated, a friend of mine, his parents were, uh, so he's American, his parents were trying to uh, avoid the draft in the States. And so they went and they bought land up near Thunder Bay, where Megan's from and uh, bought it sight unseen. It was supposed to be perfect for a, uh, it turned out it was, it was, it was rock and swamp. You know, they, they can do it with it. Brilliant. Uh, I wonder if I could go back. Let's see, am I up here yet? Yeah. Um, yeah. Go back to uh, what happened after 1926 for just a moment. And I, either Duff or Alyssa Curry, who I see is on this call, knows more about this than I do, I'm sure. But um, the archives is just, they're finishing sometime this coming spring, the land database. It's been mentioned before because David Leonard is also involved. Um, who homesteaded first and they take land ownership from the beginning of settlement to 1930. And it, it comes to mind that if you paid attention to that through Duff or um, perhaps someone else, that that might lead you to names and names will lead to families that are probably still around here somewhere. Yeah. That it was just, it's just another avenue to get into some uh, you know, maybe some more information. Um, I think we, the uh, historical society, were are planning to have a lecture of some sort by a woman that is combi compiling that data as we speak and perhaps doing some analysis. Help me out here, Duff or Alyssa. Well, the work is in process. And um, again, uh, David has the brief on that. We have done quite a bit on the earliest years, and it was on uh, an internet website database and a CD-ROM as well um, from the earliest work. And that could be done, um, if I remember correctly, by geographical address or by name, because um, I've used it by name to locate uh, our family that Shane migrated out here around 1915. But I think earlier, the problem with the earlier dates is that it is, sort of a case of um, having the address, having the, the, um, the site, but also having the right name. Um, and transiency is big. So we just have to do a little digging to find out. I haven't looked at it yet for this reason or for this target, but probably Sean and Megan have. Is, is the data, and we've, we've heard about the database project and we followed it in the, the society mm -hmm. newsletter and at the archives, of course, we've talked about that before. What yeah. I was going to ask was, does it handle the issue of Métis script and land purchased with? It has Métis script. It has uh, the veteran military settlement allotments as well. Um, and um, it has usually from the very first um, claim up uh, in sequence. So it should have that material as much as possible 
those details were included in the material. Um, it, um, I remember it being pretty comprehensive. We covered it in um, a, an issue of Lobstick about 15 years ago as well. Um, one of our earlier issues on land and settlement, um, which I don't happen to have in front of me. It's in the stack of books behind me, but it had some information as well. Uh, and I must have about 500 um, CDs um, that were never bought for that uh, sitting around here in the house somewhere from that project as well. Um, so the only problem is if you've got an old enough version of Access or Excel to open it, but that's where the website may come in handy too. And we can do a little digging about who preempted what, where. Sorry, we're just trying to catch up Keep on what's in the oh, chat. I was just going to say, so Daryl popped in uh, a link to the archives website where you can look through the database. There is also capability um, through the archives to enhance certain search features. Um, and that's because all of the data is kind of um, behind that search feature that you see on the website, but there is potential uh, to have additional resources um, added to that. So for example, uh, a few years ago, we had somebody who sponsored adding a search feature to sort by veterans um, yeah. things. And so there is some, some capability on the back end to add or, or massage that data. Um, there is a cost associated with that. So that would just be something, uh, part of a larger discussion, possibly as part of the sponsorship discussion. Um, so thank you, Daryl, for, for speaking to that and, and to Duff. Yes, part of yeah. that information is on the website and some of it is um, being added. Certainly social history always starts with land and people. And so we've been trying to get that all together um, one way or another, but it, it's a growing project. Uh, partly because of the, the rate of development and the rate of settlement here, and also transiency. Um, people came, uh, they didn't even complete sometimes and they moved on, because um, this is a land of what we called hopeful travelers. Um, people arrive, hope to find Bonanza, and end up freezing, giving up, failing, and heading on, usually to the Okanagan or California. Yeah, and I think I think we talked about this at our last our last presentation and in the conversation after that 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 issue of of picking up and starting over. And mm -hmm. I feel like there's often, especially when we talk about homesteading, a lot of people think, oh, they come and they settle and they're there and that's great. But how many times people come, they settle, they try, they fail, they pick up, they try somewhere else. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. there is that that part of it. And that's something for us that we have to be considering in the archeological record too, right? Because if then someone else comes in to the same area, you know, how are we seeing that, that mm -hmm. mixture um, within yeah. the record is a big issue, especially yeah. at, at places um, at, like, like Byzance and where it is sort of a, a jumping off point. Um, yeah. But Alyssa's right, and, and Daryl has done quite a bit, and Alyssa too, to help that, that whole land-based settlement uh, database grow. And so the archives is the place to link in uh, to the website to begin to, to plow that material to bring up what it brings up. Yeah. So does uh, anybody have any, <laughs> any suggestions what our mystery feature is? I just want to know. <laughs> Does anybody remember if there was a parking lot established there? The, the only reason we say that is because it's very, very rectangular. And it doesn't make sense. The parking lot does not make sense. Uh, the only reason he thinks that is because we found an old parking key sign. for parking <laughs> sign right off the road, like in the bush. Someone had pulled it down. Um, but the, it doesn't make sense because you'd have to basically drive over this berm. Yeah. And it's a beautifully... It's a beautiful surface. It's it's the well you saw in the picture Sean starting his test unit. You can only take about five, maybe ten centimeters of dirt off, it and you hit this beautiful pebble cobble surface. And then, except for these depressions towards the north end that look like sort of typical building, um, you know, dugouts from 
below that would be sellers below building something. seller something like that but they're right next they're two right next to each other um well sounds like know. recreational uh, yes. uh, you know skating you know, rink we uh, tennis court if, yeah we were wondering if there was other buildings there before the current park buildings if there mm -hmm. had been a building um there there's we also saw like the only sort of ornamental juniper i've seen anywhere there um oh. yeah mm. i don't know it's it's very odd <laughs> mm -hmm. but it was kind of nice digging it because like we're both we both work in the maya area and we often are dealing with you know beautiful cobble ballast so <laughs> for a, a lovely floor and we were like oh this is awesome <laughs> i could dig yeah. this all day <laughs> Is that there any recreational. Aerial photo imagery for that area? Aerial photo imagery? Like historical area, air photo imagery. Wait, there is. Somebody told us about it, but we haven't accessed it yet. There we go. Yeah. yeah. It's it's online. It's a provincial service. I think you might have to pay something for it, but you can search by year. Tells you the resolution and everything. That can be really helpful. I mean, between Edmonton and the corridor, you can Edmonton and Calgary corridor, you can get back to the 1920s. Um, that area, I don't know how far it's going to go back. Yeah, I think the only aerial we've managed to look at so far is the stuff that's on uh, Google Earth, <laughs> and it's not very high quality for going back um, when you can do the time slide uh, for this area. So yeah, that's sort of yeah. one of the things where we've added into the grants uh, along with money for the 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 lot title searches, historic title searches, um, and other sort of uh, uh, documentary and archival stuff is is money for it to get access to some of that. There was yeah. um, early forestry aviation here and forest fire watches kept uh, by the old biplanes in the 20s. Uh, perhaps there's some aerial photographs or surveys done then um, sitting around somewhere, maybe in Edmonton. Uh, but the Forest Service did do flights from Grand Prairie for some years uh, until budget cut it back. I think uh, I'm just trying to remember phase one, which is the first really intense forestry survey was done in. Uh, I'm pretty sure you'd have been in the 50s by then uh, for this part of the world. But I wouldn't doubt that Byzantium was covered because um, it would, would have all been timbered from there south and forestry would have been interested. Certainly they were interested in the Wapiti and south. So, uh, but I just, I'm not so sure about the, those aerial reconnaissance flight stuff where 1928 they started. And as you say, they, they ran out of money in the thirties real quick. So sounds like, I'm not, I, I'm not sure if they had photography equipment other than a, brownie Kodak or something <laughs> leaning over the cockpit. <laughs> but um, yeah, uh, I think Daryl has said it already, the photo mapping division in uh, in Edmonton is your best bet. And it used to cost a buck fifty a print. And stereo is nice, so that was three dollars for a good look. Yeah, Sean, I've, I've actually got the 1980s sitting in my office on campus. It's a starting point, but uh, but they're probably 50s at least. Yeah, yeah, because the, the big money to do those kind of aerial inventories came in after the Duke blew in. That was 1947, I think. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm no expert, and, and this would be this would actually be a place where, where Patrick, you'd be much more of an expert um, in, in terms of I'm not good at estimating the age of trees by looking at them, but I will note that the trees in the this little pad area are much younger than the surrounding trees. So yeah. uh, I think Patrick commented on that. Yeah, oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I suspect if what you're describing is a compacted area, trees, you know, they have a tough time growing on active areas so they wouldn't we, they wouldn't keep they wouldn't regrow at the rate that the ones around would um if they're conifer by chance just count the worlds each whirl as in that whirl of branches as the stem goes up is a year and uh usually you allow 
if it's a spruce tree, you allow 10 to 15 years to get it going. So add like 10 years, you know, that, that's just a rule of thumb. Right. Well, then it looks like we're counting, looks like we're counting whirls this summer. <laughs> yeah. Or, um, I have, a student. I have I have tools <laughs> that we can count tree rings. So okay, there we go. Just remind me to bring it. And Andrew, we will invade your office to get that information from you as well. By the way, <laughs> just so you know. Excellent. Um, I also wanted to um, up earlier, uh, Donna. You had um, you had asked a question, and I I didn't quite understand what you what oh. you meant. Um, like a, a twenty by twenty centimeter. Dig? I don't. What do you mean? It's asking. Well, when you were asking, uh, you said one of the things we could do was um, help find sponsorship. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering what do we ask for a sponsorship? What would be reasonable? Are you doing a 20? You know what I mean? <laughs> oh, I see. I have no idea. I think, yeah, that, that would have to be something we talk about and not only between us but with school admin and all that kind of stuff too because any sort of formal exchange of money right we kind of try to set up something but that's a that's a great question because that it would be nice to have like give an idea and frankly we don't really know either especially to sit and think about it in terms of like say normally um particularly in alberta you dig in a one meter by one meter excavation right, right? and there's a whole bunch of them so you could do like sponsor, sponsor whatever number of that sort of thing, but we, that's a great a, a great thing to bring up, Donna, and we'll think about that. That if we did want to try to figure out how to encourage people to sponsor stuff, especially a public program, um, that to think along those lines, how we would how we would do that. It sounds like a good question for Andrew as well, yeah. um, since he's the he's 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 our institutional end on this one. Okay, thank you. Thanks, good, Donna. Good question. So, sorry, I didn't understand that. Thanks to Elizabeth as well. She, um, we'll we'll get oh. in touch with you. Yeah, I'll write down your email address right now. And thanks, Alyssa, for the sources. We always email Alyssa and bother her with, how do we find these things? <laughs> Even though she's left us. Even though she's abandoned us. Yeah. yeah, well, I think it, it's been an hour and 15 minutes now, and we kind of figured we'd only do an hour. Um, but uh, you can, if anybody has any other questions, comments, um, ideas about how, like, how to move forward with this, um, or you want to participate in some way, uh, you can just send us uh, an email. If you don't, I'll put Sean's email in here so you can write to him. <laughs> what are you again? I am S. Morton at GPRC. Ab. Ca. The other, um, the other thing that we have wanted to talk about at some point too is to have a conversation about how best to, to um, share progress about this. And I know, like with our project in Belize, we have our own website that's dedicated. Uh, to the project, um, and I shared that earlier, so you can take a look. But because this is, um, we want this to be truly community based. We were trying to think, you know, is it best that we have it has its own thing, or do we, for example, I think Sean just emailed some. I can't remember, maybe Audrey, um, whether we could get something as part of the Discover Byzantine website. Um, well, to, to always to oh, that. <laughs> I forgot to uh, to always sort of direct people to discover Byzance and um, and everything else that's happening uh, uh, in Byzance and today and and at the park. So whether we could have sort of an update tab uh, for the project specifically on there. Um, so that's something we'd love to hear back from people is is how best uh, for not for us like should we just start something of our own and people share that or do we feed into existing um, in existing outlets uh, already? And I know we briefly talked about that last time, um, mostly in terms of, you know, getting information out through the historical societies and things like that, but thinking a bit further and having something more concrete that doesn't require 
people to wait, you know, for us to have talks like this, which we would we would keep doing that, but to have something more concrete and that feeds into what uh, the community, the different, the various communities want out of this project. So that's something to consider uh, is is how we would move forward with that. Sure. So if there's not any other questions, we'll sort of leave it at that. We need to have supper. We haven't had our supper. Um, and please contact us if you have any questions. Uh, anything at all we're happy we can meet up maybe outside when it gets warmer have a distant co distant coffee distanced coffee with people uh we had hoped to have this presentation in person uh in Byzantin, uh like present day Byzantin. um but we we kind of knew in december that where things were heading so we figured it was better to do uh stuff over zoom but we also hope to have something in person of course sometime before the summer pending but yeah, that's about it for us. Thank you for the invite. Thank you. <laughs> yes, good presentation. Thanks very much. We'll see you in the spring. Good luck in Belize. <laughs> oh, fingers Xavier, crossed. You're in my Aunt 394 class. <laughs> that's who it is. I'm like, I recognize that name. <laughs> Excellent. Great. All right. Well, then we'll, we'll see you guys next time. You can stop the recording. Cool. <laughs> Bye, Meg. Bye, Sean. Bye, Mom. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Thanks. Thanks for your help this summer. <laughs> it was good fun. <laughs> I've got my metal detector ready. Oh, excellent. Oh. <laughs> but you'll only use it legally. Oh yes. <laughs> <laughs>